okay so uh, I'll introduce our speaker now Dr. Lisa Kirkendale she's she uh, started out actually in Cordova Bay here near Victoria she went to Claremont High School and then attended UVic and that's in fact where I first met Lisa she was a a co-op student with me in uh, at the Royal BC Museum in 1994. Um, and at the time I realized that she was going to go places. <laughs> and in fact, she did both literally and figuratively, <laughs> because the very next um, to end to did her master's degree at the University of Guam. And then to the University of Florida for her PhD. And then uh, she came to the Royal BC Museum for a brief stay as um, a curator of invertebrates. And then she and her husband, Peter, emigrated to Australia. And there she worked, did some research at the University of Wollongong, which is, <laughs> did I get that right? You can say it again, <laughs> it's so fun. Wollongong, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is yep, about you got it. an hour south of Sydney and then from there she ended up where she is now at the Western Australian Museum in Perth and there she is the head of aquatic zoology and curator of mollusks and uh, so tonight as you can see from the slide she's going to be talking about deep diving off Western Australia so with that, I'll hand it over to Lisa and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Phil. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's incredible to be joining you from literally the other side of the world. And um, there are many uh, wonderful guests. And I also will just acknowledge that I think my parents are there <laughs> as well, which is wonderful. Um, so thank you, Phil, for facilitating them joining. Um, so I'm actually joining you from the traditional lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people, and uh, I'm going to pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. Before I begin. So deep sea diving off Western Australia, um, and I'm the speaker. So it all started with a cucumber <laughs> and a wonderful mentor. I met Phil, as he said, during a UVic co-op work term in 1994. And we described a new species together. And that species is shown here on the upper left. That's Cucumeria pallida, um, often quite numerous in diving depths in and around Vancouver Island. And um, just a wonderful experience. We used morphological characteristics to describe it. And then it went on to be tested with genetic methods and it held up. So. We kind of, it, it lives, Cucumeria pallida lives. Um, and really that was it. That set my course in museums for life. Um, the experience that I was able to share with Phil, um, absolutely a mentor and everything that I learned, I just was committed to kind of museum um, research, museum science um, for, the, for the rest of my life. And that's the core business of naming new species, describing biodiversity and taking part in incredible expeditions. So it's not my first talk at Victorian Naturalists. I have been a member of the society in the past and I actually presented um, in 2008. I co-presented with my partner, my husband, Peter Middlefart. Um, and there's the title slide, Marine Molluscan Research, Thailand to Tonga. And I, but I can't remember what, what the day was and, and Phil and I couldn't figure it out. But anyway, it's, it's wonderful to kind of have this long association and, and be invited back again for another Marine Night many years later. And yes, Phil mentioned I've been the inver invertebrate curator. I was lucky enough to hold that post for about a year and um, at the Royal BC Museum and then personal circumstances meant that I, I needed to kind of come back to Australia and I've, and I've been here ever since. But of course I, I go back, I go back and visit, just not, not right now. 
So, so many places to explore, as Phil alluded to. I've, I've done a little bit of um, globe trotting and certainly um, did research all over the planet for my doctoral work. Um, right now, some of you may be wondering where is Perth? It is actually one of the um, most remote cities in the world. <laughs> I think many of you will be familiar with the east coast of Australia, having visited places potentially in the past like um, Sydney, which is around here, and maybe Melbourne and Tassie. It's a slide of Australia now. And, um, and we're over on the other coast. We're on the west coast is the best coast. And we're right about here. And you'll notice this beautiful green area. We're actually in a very much a terrestrial biodiversity hotspot. And we're lucky enough, we, you know, well, we're lucky and it also comes with responsibility to, to kind of take care of the beautiful endemic um, vegetation um, that we have in Western Australia. So that is where I'm coming to you from. You can see that WA is enormous. It is um, the largest state in Australia and it runs from the beautiful Kimberley, which is the tropical um, northernmost tip or shoulder of Western Australia, down through 80 Mile Beach, um, Cape Range area and Ningaloo, which you may have heard of and you'll hear later again in the talk, down to kind of Shark Bay, which you might've heard about it's a, um, uh, incredible place with stromatolites that you can see and then all the way down to the kind of the temperate south with its beautiful kind of highly endemic fauna both on land and in the sea. So that's where Perth is. We're in Western Australia <laughs> where I'm head of aquatic zoology and curator of mollusks at the museum. Um, I'll just let you know that there are a number of big expeditions and projects on the go. The Ningaloo Canyons which we'll share and I'll share with you and we'll talk about tonight is one of them, but we've been doing research six year expeditions up here off the Kimberley diving into some of kind of these remote atolls, um, as well as focused conservation systematics in this Pilbara area as well. So there's, there's a number of things on the go, very exciting. And we opened a new museum. It feels like just a week ago, November the 21st and as you can see here, um, the name of the museum is Bula Bardip, which means many stories in the Noongar language. And I hope this is gonna work and we don't have any lag time with video and um, music, uh, but I'm just gonna quickly show you a drone fly through of the new museum before we go any further.
Okay, I hope that worked. <laughs> that was fun, thanks. Okay, good, good. <laughs> and now we'll go back to the top, share another screen. Okay. So that was just to give you a little taste. Um, just in case you're interested, there are eight galleries covering everything from cultural and natural history, as well as reflections meant to kind of share stories about the many different types of people living in Perth, um, as well as others. It's uh, three times the size of the previous museum, but it really does kind of add new architecture, but it retains and is an upgrade and renovation of the old museum that was on site. Um, what's interesting is the blue whale, which you saw at the end, its name is Otto. He was in the, um, the first museum, the earlier museum, and he was actually assembled and put into the pose, which is lunging to kind of feed on krill. And it was a Canadian team that um, did that work. They flew over with their, with their young child for a period of time to kind of build the scaffolding and design the uh, infrastructure for the blue whale, which is really nice. Okay. But that's not really why we're here today. We're here to talk about an expedition on board the RV Falkor. Um, what can I say? It's an incredible vessel. It comes with an incredible staff and it has unbelievable capabilities. It's owned and operated by Schmidt Ocean Institute and that's Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Um, he was previously uh, the CEO of Google. So sometimes you hear people calling it the Google ship, but is, it is very much named after the luck dragon <laughs> in the never ending story. <laughs> Um, it's the only year round seagoing philanthropic research vessel in the world and you have to apply. It's competitive like many grants are. You have to apply um, as a team to kind of um, win uh, time on board. Amazingly, you see in the bottom, um, the bottom left here is the Sebastian, which is this incredible underwater robotic system. Um, a remotely operated vehicle. So it's unmanned. All the scientific and technical st staff stay on the Falkor ship. Um, it has manipulator arms. It has trays where you can um, collect uh, marine life from down to 4,500 meters. It has incredible um, lights and an unbelievable 4K imagery system. So you can capture images and video of uh, deep sea life that has you know, often never been captured before and just an unbelievable, unbelievably equipped machine. And we did push it to 4,500 meters on the Ningaloo Canyon expedition. Not everybody does. Um, the ship and the ROV are both made available to the international scientific community at no cost, which is an, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, but there are conditions and the conditions are quite lovely. They, uh, the scientists who win time on the ships have to agree to make their discoveries publicly available. So that includes sharing talks, um, having imagery shared. So when you're on the expedition, all of the, um, the video that's being taken by Sebastian is a live feed and turned into YouTube videos um, that's shared with the world in real time, which is it's amazing. And so you're, you're literally co-discovering kind of animal life and seeing things you've never seen before with whoever wants to kind of join the dive. And I hope some of you participated in, if not Ningaloo Canyon's um, other expeditions. Engagement is encouraged given the live feed and the incredible 4K imagery. Um, the cruise also comes with an onboard multimedia correspondent which is incredible because somebody is there helping you share your stories and your research. So you're constantly being interviewed, you're constantly being photographed. 
whether you're having a good day or a bad day <laughs> and um and your hair is on or off um but it's it results in really incredible um imagery and um videos to then share on with people the rv falcor um, has spent some significant time in canada i'm sure some of you have heard about that before uh, i think one of the latest cruises was in 2013 when um, UVIX Ocean Networks Canada um, partnered with Schmidt Ocean Institute and undertook an expedition in Vancouver Island. Um, so at that point, it was researchers from different Canadian universities looking at low oxygen and acidic waters that naturally occur, um, that often offer like a natural laboratory um, for studies around ocean, ocean acidification off the coast of Vancouver Island. And these are just some images from that work. They also, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, well, you might not be aware that they wired the abyss, that was the name of the expedition, but they were doing work to service Oceans Net Network Canada and um, the Neptune Array. And this work was done in concert with ROPOS, which is the remotely operated platform for ocean sciences. Kim Juniper, it might be a name some of you are familiar with. He's our BC, I think he's still the BC leadership chair at UVic and chief scientist at Ocean Network Canada, has been on many Falkor expeditions. And that's actually where I first heard of the Falkor, um, was through Kim. I did work with him for about a year when I was in um, Victoria, um, before I took up the position as invertebrate curator at the Royal BC Museum. And I know Kim's delivered some Vic Nats talks because I've been to them, so. So Falkor gets around. But back to Ningaloo Canyons. I know I'm having trouble just concentrating on the expedition. There's just so many other things going on that I like to talk about. So Falkor was in Perth in 2015, so five years ago. At that point, um, they were surveying uh, the big canyon right off of the city. Um, it's come back uh, for 2020. And this um, expedition is year long and so um, Falkor has committed to spending the entire year in Australia. And so there was an expedition that preceded us that was down south in Bremer Canyon. I think I have that here. Yeah. Sound south in Bremer Canyon. So in January, February of this year, and then came around, I think did another resurvey of the Perth Canyon. And then, um, and then we headed up to Cape Range Canyon as the second expedition of the 2020 series. Um, it's very strange, I'll say right now, and everybody's lives are affected by COVID. Um, we're probably very unaffected relative to most people in the world, but COVID actually kind of fully realized, <laughs> was fully realized while we were at sea. And that was in March and April. So it was, it was a very surreal experience, very surreal experience. So our aim was to do a biodiversity survey of Cape Range and Cloats Canyon. If you look here on the left, this red one is Cape Range Canyon and the green one where it, the, the edge of this canyon penetrates the shelf, excises the shelf, um, is Cloats Canyon. So those were the two canyons that we surveyed and there's a suite of them um, here as well, smaller canyons. You'll notice that it, it abuts Ningaloo so this is an kind of a world famous um, world heritage listed Ningaloo um, coral reefs right there. Um, Cape Range is the largest of our Midwest canyons. It's pretty clear actually from the image and it's adjacent to Ningaloo, which is our biodiversity hotspot. These are some of the reasons why we chose this area. Um, well, we did a biodiversity survey. It was absolutely led by museum scientists. So it was um, heavy in staff from the Western Australia Museum and heavy in taxonomists who kind of really led um, with interest in understanding the animals that live in this part of the ocean. It's been very little, very little surveyed. But we did extend our biodiversity and collecting with um, the collection of water samples, which were screened for eDNA traces, just to see if there were any animals there that we were missing. We kind of wanted to make it as inclusive as possible. And this was done by a PhD student. We'll hear more about that later. We also wanted to improve mapping in the area. Um, so we had some, some maps because Geoscience Australia had been there previously, um, but really, uh, 
mapping has changed. And so we wanted to not only remap areas that had been previously mapped, but also extend the mapping. Um, and this is really important due to development. So you can see that this green kind of rectangle where the two canyons um, are located are part of the Northwest Commonwealth Marine Reserve Network. So it is a, a, a park in, in, um, in its own way, um, but outside is a lot of oil and gas development. And um, yeah, it's, it's of concern. And yeah, just to reinforce that the number one is our Gascoigne Marine Park, which our two canyons fell into. And so obviously Parks Australia who um, oversee the use of the parks and their care. And we're very interested in not only the improved mapping but any of our findings. So those were all links in the expedition. How did we do a massive biodiversity survey of canyons that are over 4,000 meters deep. Well, it takes a lot of partnering. So we partnered up with um, um, a number of uh, researchers, so principal investigators and students from Curtin University, as well as Geoscience Australia, as I just men mentioned. And we brought in um, Greg Grouse from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who's been on Falkor expeditions before and is a deep sea expert. His favorite thing is, is worms or worms. <laughs> Um, we also had a lot of amazing students um, from Liam Cook, who was a Geraldton Senior High School student. Um, and he's part of a Follow the Dream program that supports um, high achieving Aboriginal students. And David, Georgia and Andrew, who are all doing their PhD at Curtin University. Can everybody hear? Everybody's okay? <laughs> It's great, thank you. Oh, good. Okay, I'm just like, it's so quiet. It's really disconcerting. Um, I was just going to show a video, so we'll see how this works. It's probably going to do the same thing that uh, happened last time. This is kind of the week one highlights um, that were taken by our multimedia correspondent on board named Alex Engel and just show some of the things we were seeing. And there's nothing like the video imagery that was captured. So I think this is gonna probably. It's certainly a, a window into a, a different world than most of you are living in right now. So please enjoy the, the break and the serenity. I always find it amazing to think that no human eyes have actually looked at this piece of seafloor before. So you are seeing it uh, at the same moments that we are and it's, I think it's really special. We're lucky to be catching this close-up video footage so we're taking the opportunity to look at this animal very closely. And just stunning. So there's a saying that life begets life, and it's certainly true in this case. We've zoomed in on the sea cucumber to see that it's covered in what we thought were tiny hairs, which have turned out to be hydroids, which are related to corals and sea anemones. And it's just covering this animal. And we're just admiring the view, really. Our expedition aims to try and fill in some gaps of, in knowledge we have about biodiversity in the deep sea off Western Australia. Uh, it's very underexplored. We haven't had the opportunity to use an ROV such as Sebastian from the Schmidt Ocean Institute. So I hope you're as excited as I am. It could be a long day of looking at rocks or it could be an incredibly exciting day. Either way, you'll have to stay tuned to find out what happens. Welcome to the deep sea.
Hi everyone, I'm Janelle Ritchie from the WA Museum. This is my favourite animal, it's a Hymenaster slime star, and we think that they use slime as a defensive mechanism. And they're super cool, so we hope you enjoy. This is a faceless cusk eel, um, which has generated quite a high level of excitement from our fish curator, Glenn Moore. Please enjoy the footage of this amazing creature. Welcome to the bottom of the sea floor. We have a little welcoming committee here waiting for us today. I'm Dr. Nerida Wilson from the Western Australian Museum, and this is the last of our series of dives. I hope you're enjoying this as much as we are here. The control room is loving this. It's beautiful. We are just absolutely in admiration of this beautiful glass sponge garden that we're watching here. Just want to say thank you to all um, joining us today and along, along the cruise. Um, just want a quick special shout out to some of you who are in isolation, including my parents, John and Lorraine Kirkendale. I know you've been watching with bated breath, but these amazing dives, so thank you all. Scientific milestones. Did we achieve much on the expedition? And now I'm like, not, okay. Yes, we did. We had 20 remote operated vehicle dives. Um, so things happen, storms come up, gear breaks, and you don't always get done as much as you planned, um, but you get something done. And that something is often never been done before. We visited 16 stations over five weeks at sea. Uh, for a total of 181 hours of investigation. 12 of the stations were at Cape Range Canyon. And on this image here, that's the big one in the upper, the upper area. And four stations were at Clotes Canyon, which I'm just showing you with my pointer here. So the focus was really about Cape Range. We deployed five autonomous reef monitoring structures and they're called ARMS in Cape Range Canyon at five sites. And they were all deployed relatively deep, like I think upwards of 3,500 meters. So these structures are popular. They're being rolled out by the Smithsonian and they've been being placed in, in shallow coral reef environments. This is the first and deepest deployment um, in the deep sea that we're aware of. And so that was really exciting for us um, to work with some of the Smithsonian scientists to do so. So we've, we've deployed them and we've left them in, in the ocean and um, hoping to come back for a repeat voyage in a year or two. Now, three years, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> have to get that organized um, to see what they capt capture. So what they facilitate is the settlement of small animals that you're not able to otherwise sample using a remotely operated vehicle with manipulator arms and various nets and kind of suction tubes and, and sediment pumps. So it's enabling sampling of a, of a different um, biota. We completed over 11,000 kilometers squared of multi-beam bathymetry to improve mapping in the area and did 20 push cores sampled for grain size, as well as 12 deep sea video transects um, that we completed, led by kind of Geoscience Australia, Dr. Rachel Proslowski, who was on board um, for parks consideration. What did we find as far as marine life? Um, our estimate is that we found up to 30 new species 
And of course, you know, the long work is happening now, which is verifying whether they're um, known species or species new to science. But this is just a, uh, an overall slide of images of all different sorts of animals um, that we were finding on the expedition. I decided to show, share with you some of my top picks. Um, my interest was actually in chemosymbiotic bivalve fauna, and that's what I was hoping to find during the expedition. Well, I didn't, um, but what I was entranced with, um, which uh, you would be too, and you will be if you can watch the videos, is the incredible um, cephalopod or cephalopod squid life that was common in the blue water zone. And so while the, um, Sebastian was going from the surface down into the deep sea. It was a two hour journey to the bottom, especially because we were operating in really deep, in really deep um, conditions. And so in that two hour time, we passed through um, in incredible areas um, of plankton and blue water. And at about 1500 meters, pretty regularly, we started to encounter these incredible squids. And I'm just sharing with you a few of the images of what I call the squid smorgasbord, um, just to kind of help you to understand what we were seeing. So this is a cockatoo or glass squid. Um, we haven't identified it to species yet, but we're working with Mandy Reed at the Australian Museum, and that's her expertise to do so. Um, they're pretty funny <laughs> because here's the beak. <laughs> if you're used to looking at an octopus, here's the mantle. Um, the hair is, are <laughs> actually um, tentacles and um, these are the eyes. And, and this particular individual looks like it's had a tough night. It's been a bit of a bar brawl or something with a unshaven uh, mug <laughs> and two black eyes. This is a beautiful flower vase squid. Um, the, the ROV manipulator arm is sampling using a brush, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. Incidentally, this big tray area is um, the collection area. So that's where you'll pick up an animal and pop it into one of these um, compartments. And so that's also where tools and gear are stored that are used on the way down or the way up or on the bottom. This is another um, type of glass or cockatoo squid, obviously different than the one with the two black eyes. Um, just beautiful coloration, very transparent. You can just see everything, two eyes, hilarious hair-like tentacles, and I don't know what that is, a little beak. I think the beak is there actually. And other species of glass squids, these beautiful Mardi Gras squids that we saw in the water column. Um, some of them we were able to actually slurp up using one of the um, one of the arms, <laughs> one of the additions of the of the arms. And that that's unbelievable. I can't believe we were able to do that. These are some cephalopod paralarvae, and this is another type of glass squid. Um, what's pretty exciting is Magna Pinna is a really interesting big fin squid. It has these um, really long lengths that they, they kind of hold out almost like elbows where they're, if you see other images of them, you can search big fin squid and they posture in the water column. So what's interesting is that just, I think last week, a paper came out about multiple observations of the big fin squid in the Great Australian Bight. And um, it shows footage, I think of about five individuals and really, helps us understand how they behave, how they live in the water column. And it's been published um, among other authors um, by Hugh McIntosh, who's actually grew up, <laughs> grew up in Mount Dog, um, came to Australia for his PhD. We actually corresponded, corresponded while he was here. And, um, and then he's moved back to, I think he's in Victoria now and working. And so it's wonderful to see this come out and see the results of that expedition work he was involved with and um, know that we actually, we didn't just get imagery, we actually caught one. Um, and so we have one of the first records of an, of an actual specimen. So that's really exciting. And that's the image of it back in the lab. Um, probably the most 
spectacular squid that we saw. I don't think it's just me that feels this way. I'm a little biased as a mollusk curator was Taningia danai, described by a Danish fisheries biologist, um, also known as the octopus squid. It just went swooping past with this cloak of kind of velvety carmine. And you can kind of see that here. It's kind of wrapping, wrapping itself, its mantle. And then, and it kind of opened and flashed at us. And it didn't just flash with the cloak, it actually flashed with these incredible photophores um, situated um, at the end of the animal. And it just literally took our, our breath away. So it, it absolutely kind of, it came in and it grappled with the umbilical cord of, of Sebastian, the ROV, and you could feel it. You could, you actually could feel it. So it, it certainly, um, was in a de defensive mode and um, exploring us. <laughs> it's one of the largest squid in the world at 1.7 meters. Uh, that's the mantle length. And then kind of you add everything else and it's 2.3 meters. Uh, the largest known specimen, that's a bit, was a mature female, weighed in at 161 kilograms. So it's, it can be a sizable animal. Uh, one thing that was pretty fun was the kitchen brush of science. And um, we named that the K-Boss. And sometimes it's that, you know, the high tech $6 million um, Sebastian paired with the simplest <laughs> of utensils from your kitchen that kind of, um, that work, that end up working. And so the incredible team, um, the engineers, the um, controllers that uh, operate Ropos, uh, no, Ropos um, that operate Sebastian, um, were just amazing at fashioning kind of a little bit of an attachment for the kitchen brush so that it could be held by the manipulator arm. And then what we did is we actually tempted some of the squid with the kitchen brush, tried to kind of get an interaction going. And we ended up being able to sample tissue and a bit of mucus off these animals in the, during these interactions. And then we collected the brush with this tissue, bits of tissue, brought it to the surface. And hopefully those will be sequenced successfully as a non-invasive um, genetic sampling of the different animals that we saw. So I think we did, we tried five attempts and four were successful. So I'll keep you posted on that. Um, the top pick for our fish curator, Glenn Moore. This is him busily making a trap um, on the left with his hat on, which is always good in the Australian sun, was the faceless cusk eel called Typhlonus nasus. It looks really, as he says, super weird. Um, it has no eyes, but there's something vestigial going on there and a huge bulbous gelatinous head as well as jaws and nostrils underneath. So it really looks like it, it doesn't have a face. Um, and it's got a kind of a slender eel-like body. And it's a first time it has ever been recorded in Western Australia. So some you know, new records along the way. The top pick from our crustacean curator, Andrew Hosey, was a little bit more macabre. <laughs> Um, a white squat lobster, which were not uncommon, Munidopsis, um, which looked quite fine from the top, the dorsal view. Um, when you flipped it uh, over, you looked underneath and it was just littered with these grape-like clusters. And upon closer inspection, it, was, it proved to be um, a rhizocephalin. So it's a, um, a parasite, an endoparasite of various crustaceans it's a, and it's a type of barnacle. And so um, really interesting that we're seeing this in the deep sea. It's not unknown, um, but every time you see something like this um, symbiosis or a partnership or a parasitism, it's, it's just really interesting. So we'll be identifying both of those pairs. Some collection milestones were also reached. Over a thousand samples were made during the expedition from collection um, selectively, kind of hand-picked collections off the seafloor in certain cases. Um, so then relaxing and preserving appropriately. This is a giant hydroid to taking tissue samples. They've all been registered into the WA Museum databases and they include data on locality, um, all of it kind of geo-referenced imagery. Um, we have that wonderful, we have video and stills and, and 
lab-based um, photographs that we took up, uh, we took of kind of key characters um, back on the ship and we preserved them in a variety of different ways. Um, the most, not only for morphological analysis, but also tissue subsampling for genetic analysis. And that's what David is doing in this picture here is taking some tissue samples for genetics. So everything has been sampled um, for genetic work. Where will all the collections go? Well, luckily we have the Harry Butler Research Center at the Western Australia Museum. As part of the new museum project, um, we got uh, new labs and a new wet store built. This was a wonderful $17 million investment um, before the exhibition center was redeveloped in the city. So we weren't tagged on to the end. So um, when money runs out <laughs> often, <laughs> um, it's you that don't uh, get, get things, and this certainly wasn't the case. Um, so the Harry Butler Research Center is where we store our, and, and study our wet collections. And that was open, I think it was in 2016, built in 2015, open in 2016. And it occurred as the first part of our $400 million new museum project, Boulevard. And this is where we store physical record of fauna from Western Australia, but also other parts of the world. But it is predominantly a Western Australian collection um, with very good tissue collections, um, as well as, as vouchers of specimens collected over you know, hundreds of years. It's available internationally for research and the records um, are of the metadata are uploaded to what's called OzCam and available through places like Australian Follow Directly and Atlas of Living Australia. And so they can be loaned and utilized in studies. And the data will be coming publicly available through um, the Atlas of Living Australia and ALA upload. Yeah. And the star is there, the asterisk is there to remind me it hasn't happened yet, but it should happen soon. So student involvement was very important to me and to all of us. So we had Indigenous high school student Liam Cook from Geraldton Senior High School on board. And that's him um, standing here beside Sebastian looking very serious. He absolutely bonded with the engineering crew and the crew that um, took care of Sebastian and drove Sebastian as well. And he was involved in launching and recovering Sebastian, which was just incredible to see. Again, as, as I've said, the Follow the Dream program was um, a partnership that he was involved with. And it was just a really important experience for him that he enjoyed. And he was the first house high school student on a Falkor cruise ever. Um, so I was very keen on making sure that we extended opportunities, not just to graduate students and university students, but trying to capture people just a little bit earlier before they kind of direct, um, choose what they want to do, choose a career. And so this um, was a wonderful opportunity for him. George and Esther, who's here in the middle, she was our Curtin University PhD student supported by Schmidt Ocean Institute for some of her work. And here she is um, taking out the water samples um, that she collected and she's leading that eDNA, environmental DNA component to look at traces of animals from the water column. Some may already be um, collected by us, um, whole animals that we brought back on board, but we hope to also find evidence of animals that we, we didn't see or we didn't collect. Yeah, so she did a lot of filtering. <laughs> it was spent a lot of time filtering water on board, 2000 liters. Um, yeah, she was busy. Two other doctoral students were supported, as I said, and, um, and more were planned. So the impact of COVID was such that Shanae Tesling, who was going to come out and replace Liam after he completed his two weeks on board, was not able to come out. So a few people got off um, the ship after two, two and a half weeks of the five week uh, entire duration, um, but we couldn't take anybody on, on board um, due to COVID restrictions. So it, our, it was definitely a different trip um, than we had planned. Sharing our voyage. We had, I think over 148 news articles and this was kind of collated at the time that the cruise ended. So it's more than that now. Videos, radio stories uh, from 26 countries, including the New York Times, the Guardian, BBC, 
kind of picked up the stories. The story that they were most excited about was um, the Siphonophore Apollemia Spo, which was kind of this encounter that was a chance coming up through blue water and seeing, you know, this string light, string like Siphonophore, it basically looked kind of eerie, almost like a UFO um, spiraled out in the water column. And um, we shared the footage as something that we thought people would be interested in. Uh, I think it became really um, interesting to everyone because it was so large. And so right now we're trying to estimate the actual size, but certainly people have suggested it may be um, one of the biggest uh, marine organisms ever, ever seen. So we're following that up with accurate measurements. The combined social media impressions were estimated at around 5 million. So we really partnered and shared the dives. Here's Nerda, our chief scientist, and Greg Rouse from Scripps, um, looking at the screens and narrating the dives, which we all did, um, to share what we were seeing with the world. And it was, it was amazing because it was a time when COVID was really just um, happening for people and impacting people's lives. And so for them to be stuck at home and log in and chat with us and, and watch and share this incredible um, voyage was, I think, really, really wonderful. Um, I know we had some people um, calling in, they were, you know, at home, the kids were out of school and they were using the imagery in the voyage as a resource, an educational resource. We did some ship to shore calls, uh, that kind of thing. So that was wonderful. And we're still delivering talks. <laughs> we're, still, we're still talking and, and that's we're just very happy with that. So we have another um, video that I won't be showing. <laughs> That's really the highlight video. It's an overview of um, really fantastic clips from the voyage. And I'm not even going to go there, but there is the link, which I will share with you in a chat at the end. And that's Andrew taking a fantastic photo um, of a squat lobster in the lab. The expedition was successful in many ways, uh, but it also caught the eye. We submitted a proposal um, to be considered for the Premier's Awards, which happen every year, and we won. So we won 2020 Premier Science Award in Western Australia for the engagement initiative of the year. And that was because the, the sharing that we were able to achieve and the scope and the reach of the expedition. So that was a fantastic end to a difficult year. Um, yeah, and really, I think that's about all I wanted to share it was challenging times. We were having to learn about spacing when we were out at sea because we had to get off and return to families and just be safe because we certainly were in a bubble out, out at sea. All of the videos and stills and blogs can be reached. They're, they're hosted at schmidtocean.org and the title of our expedition is Illuminating Biodiversity of the Ningaloo Canyons. And we're heading out again <laughs> in April 2021. As I said, um, Falkor is in Australia for the whole year. They're working on the East Coast now, but they'll be heading up to Ashmore um, next April. So we'll just, there'll be some WAM people involved in that. And I want to say thank you um, to our partners and our sponsors uh, for this work. And now I'm ready to answer questions. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Lisa. And uh, if anyone has a question, you can unmute yourself and uh, fire away. I've got a question. The question yeah. I have is, about the geology of those canyons. Is that in sediment that those canyons are made out of? Like, can you tell us about how they're formed and, and how stable they are and that kind of thing? No, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I am, a, we had, we collaborated with Geoscience Australia for a good reason. I know my limits and I am a marine biologist and do like describe new species and do quite a lot of genetics and phylogenetics to see how different animals are related to one another. But I am, I'm not a geologist. They are loose. There was a lot of movement. Um, 
some of the definitely the the floor is is soft sediment, which is why we why we were able to take push core samples. But as far as the age and um, just the the you know the canyon materials, uh, I, I'm not even I'm not even going to try because I might get it wrong, and that would just leave you um, uninformed. But I can supply you with um, published studies. Uh, as I said, Geoscience Australia did um, visit the canyons earlier. I think that it was a study published in about 2008 from an expedition they did there to explore the geology of Cape Range Canyon. So I, I think I'll just follow up with those resources. Great, thank you. Yep. I'm just going to try and do this. Lisa, I have a question. This is Verena Tanikliff. Hi. Uh, that, that was great, Lisa. I, I, um, I loved it. I love Falcor. Um, and I'm really impressed that you used the time in your descents and ascents to look at the water column. So tell us, why were the squids predictable at 1,700 meters? What's, uh, what's the feature in the water column there? food I guess I actually I don't know I, I actually don't know we haven't we bit literally we came back from the cruise and um, have kind of taken care of all the samples registered them in the collections started doing some genetic work on them and then have been full-on busy with uh, opening the new museum so I would okay. be happy to hear why you think they're Often, I mean, it was just a like an observation, like a. I, I just wondered if the if the CTD showed that there was either a low oxygen layer or is yep. there a discontinuity at that point? Um, haven't even haven't. <laughs> okay, don't know. Haven't All even right. looked. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, I mean, it, to kind of be captivated by the blue water was an aside anyway, and yeah. then to kind of explore. Um, you know, any kind, I mean, we'd really have to go look carefully at the data to see, it was a feeling, okay, it was more like a right. feeling that 1500 okay. meters, I better start looking again, I can't have my nap, or I can't go and eat, I have to be watching the screen, because I will start seeing the squid again. Um, I certainly didn't seem to be the same species, or a huge abundance of, of squid, it was different, uh, diversity of different squid, but around that time, Around that depth is when we started right. seeing them. But those are really good um, questions. And those are what I think students could <laughs> help with. The ingenuity of your um, your dish, uh, your dish um, scrubby brush is fantastic. Hey, boss. For sampling. I got to remember that. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, that, that is absolutely um, Nerida Wilson. She's the chief scientist. I was a principal investigator, but really it's it was my first deep oh, sea yeah. trip. I usually um, have been doing, uh, you know, diving related biodiversity research, um, coral reef um, focused expeditions, some uh, temperate work. And so this, I was like, I was a newbie. This was my first deep sea trip. So um, yeah, I was out there to learn. Lisa, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was just interested that long worm-like thing that you showed us, how big was it approximately? A, meters, centimeters? Yes, so there's a and whole bunch of meat. There's what a whole phylum bunch of does it belong to? What, what, what was it? It's a saphonophore. Uh, what? Sorry, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna quickly. There was, there've been some estimates. We're very testy about um, guessing how long it was um, from the video footage. We really want to kind of get it right before we um, make any announcements, but I'm just going to figure out what the, um, there was some estimates, just throwing up, estimate. Um, It doesn't have to be accurate. I was just wondering the, the scale, like, is it a, was it several meters that we saw or? Yes. So kind of one estimate from the team is that it was 47 meters. So 154 feet long. Oh my. 
Yeah, so it was it was big. And it was a siphonophore. It was a siphonophore. Now, what are they? Um, they are they are deep sea predators. <laughs> Related to what, what phylum or Nidaria? Okay, jellyfish. So sea jellies, uh, hydroids, corals, octocorals, sea fans. Okay, thank you very much. So, Lisa, we have a question, a few questions on the chat. Yes. Uh, one from Jim Cosgrove. <laughs> Were there any benthic octopus? We didn't see any. No. No. Um, we didn't see one, and that it was surprising. So the trip to Bremer that happened before the Ningaloo Canyon expedition did see a couple, um, and there's beautiful footage of them. But no, we we just saw the squid. Yeah. Hmm. Um, what kind of animals were you getting out of the mud? Did you get anything in the core samples or like? Worms, Not much, actually. So okay. those were sieved topside by Rachel from Geoscience Australia, and they were pretty barren, uh, both from a, you know, dead shell, not many dead shells, and, and not much, um, even small microscopic life, which is another interest of mine. So no, it was, it was pretty quiet in the sediments. Hmm. Um, obviously, you're constrained when you're using Sebastian to sample. You're not kind of trawling through sediment, so you're not. We're not. We're very selective. Um, so there's, I'm sure, a lot of in fauna that we missed in terms of worms, uh, in fauna bivalves and clams. Um, although we did get a few clams um, and mussels, we but it was more um, bivalves and um, clams attached to hard bottoms. Good. Um, uh, we also uh, somebody else. So Michael Rogers wants to know where is Curtin University? Curtin University is here. Ah. So it's in Perth. There are five kind of major five six universities in the Perth area. University of Western Australia is probably the best known. It's kind of I think it's one of the top five in Australia. Then there's um, Curtin University that's very close to the Western Australia Museum. Um, no, I'm like losing Murdoch University, Edith Cowan University, Notre Dame University. Hmm. And so for a city of 2 million, uh, it's got quite a lot of, of unis over here, but you know, it is the most remote city in the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what it's classed as? <laughs> it is. It actually is known as one of the most remote cities in the world. So any more questions for Lisa? Sounds like uh, for No, quiet. I have a question. I have a question. Oh, Kate Lambert. <laughs> Hello. Kate. <laughs> nice Kate with the sushi baby. <laughs> yeah, you know, keep it nice the marine theme. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to know about like you, you've obviously identified a bunch of new species and um, you've got a lot to go through still probably, but what do you do with this information now and how do you continue to share it internationally and with your community? Yes. So the videos are on YouTube. So they're publicly available, all the assets that I've been trying to share <laughs> in my talk. Um, there's also other similar assets like blogs and, and whatnot on the Ningaloo Canyons website that schmidtocean.org hosts. And then the data and, the, and then the images that we also have copies of, um, the images are gonna be trickier to share. We'll have to look into that because they're just enormous. But the data, including you know, who collected it, where it was collected, the ocean conditions and everything, they're in the museum database. And so that can be shared through a portal called Atlas of Living Australia or ALA. And so it's ready to go, but we just need to upload it now. And that probably will happen within the next month or so. Some of the data will start, will start going up. So it is part of our deliverables and part of our conditions that we share that data. I think it's within a year. So really important. Yeah. 
Awesome. Thanks. I'll check that out. And the, and the new museum is amazing. And the, I'm glad you could see it. <laughs> the one video that worked. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they're not private. They're things that you can go and explore. And there's many more. I just I just grabbed a few. But yeah, it's been it's been an unbelievable year for us here. And considering COVID, I, I can't believe sometimes that we were able to open our museum on time and on budget. Um, just just incredible um, commitment by so many people. Yeah. Congrats. Thanks. So, uh, Lisa, do you think you could um, share the uh, links for the the two YouTube videos? Yes, um, I yeah, I sent it to everyone in the meeting. Keep I don't know why, but Helen Davis keeps <laughs> popping up privately is my default, and so I've oh, just shared the link oh. <laughs> of the second of the second video. Um, which are multimedia highlights. I love this one because there's this one clip of it where I'm in the middle of an interview and the fish curator comes up and says, there's a giant flashing squid on the screen. You, you've got to come. <laughs> it's, yeah. And that's how the, that's all the whole expedition was. It just every day, new surprises, um, unbelievable discoveries. You're sharing it with the world and, uh, and you just, you just can't believe what you're seeing. I can't believe what you're seeing. And you're, and you're supported by this incredible team. You have not only your colleagues, but Schmidt and the Falkor crew, which just, I mean, they've got workshops on board. They can build and fix anything. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just a, a, an amazing experience. And we feel, all of us feel very fortunate. So we have a number of comments. Great talk. Thank you. Many thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the award. Cheers. Um, thank you for taking the time to share your research. And thank you, Lisa. Wonderful. It's the modern day Jason <laughs> project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's, um, I mean, I can't say that, you know, scientists trying to take videos of themselves doing their research or other non-professionals filming you and trying to interview you doing your work, it just uh, ends up looking very amateurish. So having this dedicated person, Alex Engel, who was exceptional, filming us and just dedicated, that was his only job was to share stories and get the messages out was, I will not forget that. That will be a part of expeditions going forward. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you want to try and play one of the videos again, give it a try. Now that we're at the end. <laughs> sure. The, the last one is really good. That's the one I really wanted to share. So I have done these talks with other people, but they've been Australia based or locally based and they didn't have as didn't have these problems. So I didn't worry too much. I thought it would all work out. I should have worried more. That's always that's always the bottom line. You should worry more test it more times worrying never fixes anything so don't <laughs> worry well it makes you spend more time ensuring that you've embedded videos and things like that can't make light travel faster across the world so you know <laughs> well thank you for your understanding oh yeah this one no. The highlights are literally ever changing. So yeah, the most recent thing we've looked at and found, I'm so thrilled about, I can hardly believe. Then five minutes later, the next thing we find, I'm so thrilled about, I can hardly believe we have it. <laughs> Visually, we found this incredible solitary hydroid, a relative of corals and sea anemones that stood well over a meter tall. The imagery of that, I think, will become the iconic you know, picture for the cruise. I think that's likely to be a new species. So we found some really spectacular worms that are pelagic, that are swimming worms. I'll be sequencing the DNA of them pretty quickly and establishing if they're new records for Western Australia or if they're new species, in which case we'll name them. So high excitement already, um, even before we can properly sit down. Uh, this is a faceless cuskiel. Please enjoy the footage of this amazing creature. 
new record for Western Australia. As far as I know, it's the deepest specimen of fish that's ever been taken from Western Australia. And certainly, I've never seen any footage of this thing underwater from Australia. So to, to put all of those things together for this just one thing, let alone all of the other species that we're doing the same thing for, it's just fabulous. You could imagine uh, maybe 100 years ago, you collected something. You didn't imagine a genetic revolution coming. You didn't imagine that it would have this entire new utility, you know, 50 odd years later. Um, and so, we're just, we're going to imagine what can happen next with our collections. Hello? Hello. Sorry to interrupt, there's a flashing giant squid on the... Seriously. Um, it's super exciting. <laughs> and I actually need to go now. <laughs> Every moment is kind of new for me and I, yeah, I live for those. And so it's a, an incredibly exciting trip because those moments just keep rolling out. Uh, they don't stop. Being able to share those unique moments with all the people that are watching is actually really exciting for us as well. So I hope you're as excited as I am. It could be a long day of looking at rocks or it could be an incredibly exciting day. Either way, you'll have to stay tuned to find out what happens. In rushes Glenmore, our curator of fishes, to announce that there's a, like a large squid. For me, it captures this, this cruise perfectly, which is you go out and you're expecting certain things, and all of a sudden you're just taken sideways, and you're now in the moment of discovery and doing something you never expected, seeing something you've never seen. So it's just magic. That, that was, I've never done anything like that. Our goals for this expedition was to understand the biodiversity off Western Australia in a much deeper way. And, and this is because we haven't actually explored the deep ocean around that coastline very much at all. Simply by carrying out these surveys, we've already increased our knowledge hugely. Every day we're finding amazing critters, new records for Western Australia, new records for Australia, new things that we haven't seen before, and new species. So it's, um, it's just been an amazing experience. Well, that worked. That one worked? Yeah. Oh, so I didn't do anything differently. Yeah, strange. I don't it know, might be buffering time or something like that, where it uh, buffers enough to, in order to be able to display to everybody. Yeah. Great. All right. Are there any other questions? Good morning, everybody. If you are joining us, you are joining Schmidt Ocean <laughs> Institute and the research <laughs> vessel. <laughs> I see somebody named Melissa Frey that's joined in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the the other WA. <laughs> that's just fantastic. What time is it is it in Perth? It is just about one o'clock in the afternoon. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's Tuesday. We just, we had a, yeah, I had to lead a departmental meeting and I shifted it so that I could just, yep, and focus on the talk. Um, so I had half an hour before <laughs> to sort it out and load it up, but it's all good. But I just, if there aren't any more questions, I don't, I, I'm not sure if people want to ask anything else. <laughs> I'm happy to stay, but you might be getting <laughs> a little bit tired. No, it's just uh, early evening here, almost nine o'clock. I'd like to hear from Jim Cosgrove about the midwater squid and what and whether he's seen anything like that in his years of research. Yeah, Are you still there, Jim? Unmute him. Hello, Lisa. Hi. No, those, uh, I've seen something similar with the barrel-eyed squid, that uh, your little dump, dumpy guy with the bruised eyes. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh, no, it's so seldom that we get to look at, at uh, big, uh, big water, uh, midwater squids and that kind of stuff. There's just so much yeah. to learn. Yes. And, and the amazing thing is we were able to capture either some DNA from animals we had really good imagery of, or we actually, we were able to capture some of the animals. And um, we're working with Mandy Reed now to kind of um, write up a cephalopod, cephalopod paper, a squid paper. And she, it, she said the imagery is so good and it's, and it's such of such high resolution, she can identify based on images in many cases, which is just, you know, just not usually done. Taxonomists generally don't want to go there. <laughs> well, half the time you never get to see the diagnostic features anyways. That's it's it. So blurred yeah. or, you know, they, uh, you know, you're looking for a third right arm and it's hidden yeah. all the time, so. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you, Lisa. Congrats. Nice to see you too. Take care, everyone. Um, not in a good situation with COVID, I think, right now. No, does, uh, does, does Mr. Kirkendale want to say something? <laughs> Did you unmute him? I'm going to ask him to unmute. I don't know. Oh, oh he's unmuted. Okay. Hi, Dad. <laughs> I guess I'm pretty sure nobody, we don't know how to chat with you watching you live right now. Help. Oh, <laughs> I think, I think I know what he's going to say. He's, we're a big fan of um, Gary Larson. He's going to say fools. I'll destroy them all. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to tell me my references are all baboons and those kind of things. <laughs> Okay, I guess he's being shy. He's not. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you very much, Lisa. It was great to see you and hear about your expedition. Uh, there's nothing, no other questions. Um, we can... Yeah, and feel free to contact me directly and I can follow up on anything else you might want to know, including anything about Falkor. Um, I will follow up on the geology question and there's a good reference paper that I can send through on that. Um, yeah, so just feel free to contact me. You can find me online, Lisa Kirkendale at museum.wa.gov.au and be happy to answer your questions. And I miss